So the title is Appropriately, Appropriate Dietary Guidelines for Improving Population Health. What does the balance of evidence suggest? So we're going to be talking about evidence here tonight. And we have an epidemic of chronic disease that's indisputable, diabetes, obesity, Heart disease mortality has fallen in recent decades, but we have to credit to a great extent the cessation in smoking and a massive barrage of medications, preventative meds, and also procedures. So more important perhaps is heart disease morbidity. And heart disease morbidity is being predicted to become even higher in the coming decades. So that's the amount of heart disease atherosclerosis illness we have. And it might come as an interesting fact to people that right now from the CDC figures, the Centers for Disease Control, they're not my figures, but I dug them out, 64% of adults in America age 60 or age 45 and above are now essentially diabetic, pre-diabetic or diabetic, but it's kind of an arbitrary distinction. So we now have a population where the majority are essentially diabetic. So any dietary guidelines we should have should be cognizant of that cohort because they are the ones who suffer most of the disease. So we failed, uh, I think, uh, to identify and address the primary dietary root causes for our modern malaise. And one reason might be that we cannot agree on the evidence on what it says. So there's four types of evidence, basically. First is epidemiological, associational, or correlation evidence. And that can show correlations, but never prove causality. And that's one of its main criticisms. The second type of evidence is mechanistic, plausibility. So the mechanism which links your factor, proposed factor, to the problem has good physics and biochemistry linking it. But this can be very subjective and can be abused. Anyone can tell a mechanistic story. The third type is RCT, randomized control trial, which is seen to be the gold standard. And that can prove causality if well executed, a trial like that. But People have pointed out, quite rightly, that many of our RCTs have not been done in the best possible way, and there are flaws amongst them. So maybe they're not perfect. And the final evidence is clinical. So the N equals tens of thousands, where doctors, patients have changed their diet, not according to the guidelines, and have seen dramatic improvements in their health, and even reversal of diabetes. So there are the four levels of evidence, and I'd like to invite now uh, Dari first, perhaps, to give a three-minute summary, maybe, of your feelings around those four levels of evidence and what they tell us. Uh, thank you. So I, I think that you know evidence grading is in incredibly important, and um, you know, first there are multiple levels of observational studies. So there are cross-sectional ecologic studies, which is the type that Gary described where you compare healthy and unhealthy people. There's prospective observational studies, there's demographic studies, but the lowest level of observational studies is anecdotal evidence, anecdotal clinical experience. That is absolutely, ir you know, irrefutably the lowest quality evidence. And there are so many examples of, of where we've been misled by you know, using just your own anecdotal evidence. That is where patients and doctors um, have the highest propensity for bias because they see something work and they think it, it works. And you know, in the 1800s, 1700s, we bloodlet people. You know, we, we gave leeches and bloodlet people because we thought that was improving their health. More recently, um, people have probably seen these studies, um, many orthopedic surgeries, many back surgeries, many knee surgeries, that orthopedic surgeons and, and patients you know, said, oh, these absolutely work when tested in randomized controlled trials showed absolutely no efficacy. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, um, angioplasty was routinely done on stable coronary lesions, and doctors and patients swore it made them feel better until randomized controlled trials showed that angioplasties were being, uh, you know, excessively done and really had no benefit to do angioplasties on, on stable coronary lesions. So there's, there's time after time where, you know, anecdotal experience, which is very important for hypothesis generation, um, is the lowest level of, of evidence. I think that um, you know, the highest level of evidence comes when all four types of evidence, clinical experience, mechanistic studies, uh, prospective observational studies, not cross-sectional cross studies as Gary described, um, and randomized controlled trials all show consistent findings. And so 
the paradigm of nutrition that I showed, which is not conventional wisdom. I mean, I'm, it's interesting in this room, I'm viewed as the conventional one. When I go to most nutrition conferences, I'm the one saying fat doesn't matter, saturated fat's not a big deal. I've been saying that for 20 years, and I'm you know, sort of the, 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 the extreme person, and here I'm the, the conventional person, it's interesting. But, but you know, the, the, the lines of evidence I showed are from a very careful, unbiased look at all those types of evidence. What are the mechanistic, mechanistic studies? What are the randomized control trials? What are the clinical experiences? And so I think that you know, we have to remember, and another example of clinical experiences, there have been several papers published from, there's an online cohort of like 10,000, 20,000 people who are on low-fat diets, who are on an online cohort, and there's been multiple papers published that the most successful people are those that have the lowest fat diets and the highest carb diets. Of course they're successful. They're their own clinical experiences and anecdotes. So there's doctors and patients that swear by low-fat diets that, that they're absolutely work, and they're just as large and just as plentiful as the doctors and patients in this room. So, so that's where you have to have trials which have been done, you have to have prospective observational studies which have, have been done, and you have to have mechanistic studies which have been done to tease out uh, uh, the differences. Okay, so I think um, first we have to establish what it is we want to learn from these trials. I think that's one place where there's, uh, some of the thinking is not as clear as it could be. So for instance, if you want to know, you know, you've been struggling with obesity or diabetes your whole life and you want to know whether a diet works for you to fix it, then anecdotal observation is the very strongest thing you can do. You don't need a clinical trial to tell you <laughs> if eating a low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diet makes you healthier. If, you know, you need the, the clinical trial to tell you if that diet works is likely to work better than another diet, uh, the low-fat diet or a vegan diet or some variation on paleo versus South Beach. There you would need a clinical trial because you can only do one diet at a time and you can't randomize yourself. And you need the clinical trial to know if you're going to live longer, to get a probabilistic assessment of whether you're going to live longer. So I can switch to this diet. I can lose weight, and my lipids can get better or worse regardless, I can feel a lot better, I'm not struggling with the, whatever the, my chronic disease happened to be. All those things I do not need a trial for. And it always amazes me whenever I read an article saying, you know, predicting that if you were to switch to a, a low-carb ketogenic diet, you'll get depressed or you'll get, you know, something else. You don't need a diet. A trial to tell you that. What we want, one of the things we want to achieve is to get people to realize they can try it for themselves and not going to kill themselves. But the question is, are you going to die prematurely? And that we don't know. So there you need a clinical trial. To me, what the observation, what the epidemiology gives you is a, is a hypothesis about whether or not you are going to live longer or less long, whether you'll be healthier or not, you'll be at higher or lower risk of heart disease or diabetes or atrial fibrillation based on what we see in a population statistically and based on what the healthier people in the population are the people without atrial fibrillation versus with atrial fib or without depression versus the, what those people are eating. And then you can generate a hypothesis. My problem with those studies is that they generate an, an, almost an infinite amount of hypotheses. Some of them are completely unreasonable some of them all too reasonable, and so it's all too easy for me to believe that these are, that any one of them is as likely to be true as the one that the nutrition community is focusing on. Um, the problem with mechanistic hypotheses, and I'm aware of this while I'm giving my talk, is you come up with the hypotheses and people will give you mechanisms. You know, it's if I find a reason to think that Martians cause heart disease, I will see 10 papers in the published in the literature that were peer-reviewed within two years explaining how Martians might cause heart disease, just in case the hypothesis turns out to be true. So a mechanism isn't good enough, and you can then rate your value of the mechanisms. Um, I ultimately come back to, I, if I want to know whether I'm going to live longer, and one, again, one of the fundamental differences, I think, between the kinds of research Dr. Mozaferian is talking about is we're talking about preventive medicine. We're talking about preventing the onset of chronic diseases or slowing it down and living longer. 
So in these situations, we can't necessarily see any change in our health status in the short term. And we do the clinical trial, we look at the hypothesis to try and get some idea what's true in the long term, but we never personally experience that. We have no, again, we have no information. If somebody died, you know, who was it? The Luke Perry just had a, died of a stroke at 52. We have no idea why. Whether it's because of his diet, maybe he was eating a vegan diet, maybe he was eating a ketogenic diet, although we probably would have found out by now if either one of those were true. <laughs> so when we're dealing with preventive medicine, and this was a point made by David Sackett in a famous op-ed. David Sack was a, a legendary Canadian epidemiologist and evidence-based medicine specialist who said, look, preventive medicine, you're dealing with people who are healthy. And then you're telling them what to do to remain healthy longer. You're not dealing, it's not somebody who's come into your hospital and he's dying and you've got to make a quick decision or somebody who's got heart disease or has had a heart attack and you've got to figure out what drugs or what surgery to use to get them healthy. Those are different situations. These patients are, in theory, healthy. And we're supposed to keep them healthy longer by our intervention, what we tell them to do. And you have a higher uh, level of evidence you need to make that kind of step because your first the requirement both in public health as well as medicine is do no harm. So when I see these kinds of discussions and somebody tells me I have to drink, I don't know, soy, canola oil, good? Canola oil, good. Okay, so I should cook with canola oil, and if I do so... From I'm randomized gonna, trials. I'm going to live good. longer, right? <laughs> From randomized trials, yes. Yeah, so now we've increased my likelihood of living longer. I don't know that trial. Um, we're going to have to discuss that offline. I want... Then I can't take somebody's word for it. Not only that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed my kids canola oil. Because in theory, they're going to live longer. They're going to be eating canola oil every other day for the rest of their life. I need to do more than trust someone's word that they're an expert and I'm not. I need to see pretty hard evidence. So that's where I keep coming back to clinical trials, looking at hard endpoints, are the only thing we could ultimately rely on when we're, other than the anecdotal observation from personal experience. Okay, thanks, Gary. I'm going to go off the script for a moment now and just thinking of this bacon. And as you said yourself, Dari, <laughs> Dar Dar uh, prospective epidemiological studies obviously are different than the cross sectional ones, and they have more power because they measure early and they track over time. But if you take the meat and cancer from the World Health Organization, I was quite struck by that. The hazard ratios were 1.1 for red meat, 1.2 for processed red meat. Do you not think that the healthy user bias could eviscerate hazard ratios that small? Because everyone has been told for many decades about the unhealthiness of meat, the unhealthiness of saturated fat, and the healthiest people are programmed to do more of that behavior. Uh, a 1.1, 1.2 could very easily be reversed, perhaps. Yeah, so I, I, I... So, absolutely. I think that for unprocessed red meat in particular, where there's very small um, hazard ratios uh, for, for cardiovascular disease, for stroke, for mortality, if you notice, I didn't say uh, unprocessed red meat raises risk of cancer. Uh, I don't think the evidence is sufficient. I don't think unprocessed red meat does raise the risk of cancer. I don't think it raises the risk of, of a stroke. I don't think it raises the risk of heart disease. There is a more moderate relative risk for uh, type 2 diabetes, and, and so you see the same studies, the same people, they have no increased risk of cancer, they have no increased risk of stroke, they have no increased risk of heart disease, but they do have increased risk of diabetes. So if it's confounding, you'd expect that 1.1, 1.2 to be seen across all those diseases, but it's specific for diabetes. Uh, and then secondly, you add the mechanistic uh, evidence, the clinical evidence, as I mentioned very briefly. There's mechanistic studies that heme iron in excess uh, uh, causes pancreatic damage. Patients with hemochromatosis, inborn errors of, of iron metabolism that get high levels of, of iron in their bodies develop type 2 diabetes. You bleed them, you lower their iron, and their type 2 diabetes improves. Women who have higher levels of iron uh, at pregnancy have higher risk of gestational diabetes. So the mechanistic evidence, the observational evidence, the genetic evidence, uh, and the specificity of the association to me suggests that unprocessed red meats probably, and I said probably in my slide, probably modestly raise the risk of type 2 diabetes. Unprocessed uh, red meats, um, bacon, 
low-fat deli meats, which is a bigger problem than bacon. Bacon consumption is not that high in this country. To me, the biggest problem is all the low-fat bologna and, and you know, all the stuff that if you go to any medical conference, any hospital is out in the, you know, as a healthy option, all this low-fat processed turkey, low-fat processed roast beef, you know, that, that's the, the, the predominance of de deli meats. For cancer, the, the association is entirely specific not only for colon cancer, but for distal colorectal cancer. So to say that it's confounding that people across multiple countries with very, very different diets, very, very different lifestyles, very, very different um, background diets and risks of cancer, in all of these studies, there's just a higher risk of processed meats in distal colorectal cancer, not any other type of cancer. To say that's con due to confounding, I think, is just, is, and the relative risks are pr fairly reasonable, is why the WHO came to strong conclusions about causality. So I think that, that people are dismissing that evidence um, you know, at, their, at their own risk. And I, I, I really, I wanna add, I really like how Gary showed my sort of you know, cartoon and crossed off and added lines to it because what he showed, and I fully agree with, is that the low, and I tried to say this, the low carb ketogenic diet does a lot of the things that I think are evidence-based, right? And most importantly, it cuts out you know, refined starch, grains, and sugar and it encourages many of the healthy foods like dairy and others. And so what, what you know, people can't tell on that diet is well, what if they did add those other things, other things back that are good for them? And what if they, instead of eating bacon, they had cheese. Instead of eating bacon, they had yogurt. They would see the same benefits. And, and the last point I wanna make is that I fully agree with G G Gary that there's different potential diets for disease treatment, including obesity treatment uh, versus prevention. Um, and I was talking about a general preventive diet. Um, I don't think the, the, the treatment diets are that different, but there, there certainly can be differences. And I think for weight loss, I absolutely agree that refined starch and sugar, and I mentioned this, is the single biggest factor for, for pro prolonged weight loss. And that's why low carb diets work. I mean, that's the main reason they, they work is because you cut, cut those things out. All right. Do you want to comment on this or I have one other I comment? I was thinking about, yeah, I'm not saying wine about the, I would like to see the data on the distal colon cancer to see if it's real, how many, whether it's a, uh, uh, an average increase in meta-analyses over studies or whether it's a significant increase in every study that then manifests itself as, and, and if so, that would, be, that, that, that would be more compelling. I find it hard to believe that's the point. But the interesting thing as you're talking is I'm thinking, you could actually do a clinical trial on bacon because you could actually randomize people to eat bacon for two to three years, and then you'd have to pick your population. For cancer, carefully. you'd need 20 years. That's the problem, yeah. <laughs> but it's probably one of the few clinical trials where you could count on adherence. <laughs> And so it could actually be tested. And, so that, and the issues you brought up, I mean, it's true. It's like, for instance, you know, and again, this comes down to this, so this movement that you're, you've, and I'm grateful for you to come and be our sort of right-wing member. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to being the left-wing member of the conventional, you get to be the, um, the, these other issues of, you know, is a diet, because one of the things is the question will always be, you know, when we're looking at, uh, even in the cohort studies, and that we're looking, we're, not, we're never rarely looking at people who have been eating, you know, what would have been an Atkins diet for 40 years. And if we had been looking at, the, like in the nurses' health study, somebody on Atkins for 40 years, you know that you're eating, looking at somebody who's at a high risk of being heavier and diabetic, they're eating it for a reason. So you wouldn't be able to, I don't think you could suss out whether any increased disease risk was because of their predisposition, the reason they were eating Atkins, or because they're eating Atkins. But, but then the question is, once you're, you're looking at the population of people who are eating something close to standard American or European or Asian diets, and even the study that came out recently in atrial fibrillation, I think the low carb number was under 48% carbs or something, which is, um, so, is what you find relevant to those people who have found they could keep their personal chronic diseases under control, eating you know, low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diets, and how do we know? So they can self-experiment. They could add fruit back. We've all done this over the years or find out that they can't tolerate dairy when they thought they could. Or, um, but how do you tell if, well, you know, we've got the third, if the population is obese, two-thirds are overweight, the diabetes is, you know, over 1 in 11 now, that's a significant part of the population that's getting the conventional wisdom. 
And the conventional wisdom will certainly make them healthier, I believe, than the standard American diet, but it might not prevent more harm from being done. And how do you deal with nutritional guidance when you've got a significant portion of the population that is not healthy and that's not lean and that might need something more significant? This is when Nina Teichholz, for instance, wants and, 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 and Sarah Hallberg and, and want to get the, the dietary guidelines to at least acknowledge that low-carb, high-fat diets seem to be healthy diets so that people who may need them would feel they have access to them. Can I just add, add something briefly? So I agree with you that the conventional you know, wisdom has led to increased obesity and diabetes, but that's not what I showed. The conventional wisdom, yeah. the conventional guidelines is not what I showed on my slides. So, yeah, no, I'm not. So I think that, that you know, we, 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 you, you sort of um, unintentionally, I think, sort of implied that the conventional wisdom that's leading to obesity and diabetes is the same conventional, quote, conventional wisdom that's the advice I'm giving. It's not. I mean, the advice I'm giving, the science that I think is you know, the best current guess of what I think is the right diet based on all the evidence is not what people have been recommended for 20 or 30 years. For 20 or 30 years, they've been recommended low fat, count calories, it's all about willpower. If you fail, you're, you're a glutton, you know, all the things you said. And so we haven't yet had broad population guidance to follow the type of guidance that, that I'm recommending. And, and I agree with you fully that we need more testing of low carb, uh, you know, high, high fat diets. Um, I don't know that ketogenesis is necessary. I think there's many, many trials of weight loss. Most people can't maintain ketogenesis, but they still lose weight. So I think that's a really crucial question. Is ketogenesis necessary? Is it not necessary? If you're getting rid of refined starch and sugar, is it better or worse to have processed meats or unprocessed meats? We don't know, right, From based on clinical experience. Is it better or worse to add fruits back? We don't know really based on clinical experience. So I think that those are questions that, that should be answered. I might actually circle back just to the meat for a moment, if you don't mind, Dari. So I agree with you entirely on uh, iron. You know, excessive iron loading is a significant problem, and premenopausal women are protected through the cycle by having lower iron levels. However, I'm just thinking of something on red meat that Bradford Hill's fourth category or rule was temporality. And if you look at red meat, which is an evolutionary food, and we know from the carbon and nitrogen isotoping that it's a fundamental human evolutionary food, which would make you wonder at its deleterious effects, but also from this uh, figures from USDA, red meat has come down substantially over the last 40 years, simultaneously with diabetes skyrocketing. So the temporality seems all wrong for red meat yeah. to fit. The associations. So, so the temporality means in the same people, you look at their diets and their risk later, and that's why you need a prospective cohort study. The kind of cross-sectional demographic ecologic analysis you're describing is hopelessly flawed, and, and that type of cross-sectional ecologic analysis you're describing is exactly what the seven country study did that led to the whole low-fat diet in the first place. So, so now you're flipping it around and using the same type well, of very low-quality evidence to suggest well, that that meat I'm, consumption is not linked to, to, to cancer or diabetes. And so I think that, sorry, Bradford Hill criteria, temporality means in the same individuals prospectively establish their diets many years before they establish disease, and that's what prospective courts do well. Yeah. I agree, but I know the seven country study is complete rubbish, but I, yeah. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. I'm talking about within the U.S., within the U.S. population, right, right which is just like a huge study, if you include everyone, in a sense, and the red meat has come right down in the 40 years that diabetes has skyrocketed, would cause one to pause at the 1.1 or 1.15 hazard ratio, which could be healthy use or bias for red meat yeah. and diabetes. Agree to disagree, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that you can't, uh, I've had uh, the same argument about sugar where there I am blaming diabetes on sugar and I have people saying, but. Uh, diabetes rates continued to go up when sugar consumption started to go down, therefore there's no temporality, therefore, and then you have to evoke other possible explanations, which the, the reasonability of them depends on perspective. So you know, one of the interesting findings, if you look at cigarette smoking and lung cancer, cigarette smoking peaked in 1964 with the per capita smoking in America peak with the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health, and it took roughly 30 years for lung cancer rates to turn downward after smoking. It's 
started coming downward. And despite that lack of temporality, nobody is. I mean, it's certainly when you're weighing the evidence, if we were on a jury, that would be a piece of the evidence that we're discussing. How can we blame it on diabetes when we see red meat? You know, we're not eating diabetes, and, but it's, it's, you tick it off, you say, well, okay, so there's one piece of evidence, but let's look at what else we have. Okay, then, well, I'll move on to the vegetable oils that were mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping it to the mid, mid discussion for this hot topic. So basically, uh, there is epidemiological evidence that more vegetable oils replacing saturated fat uh, appear to reduce cardiovascular events. Uh, maybe not so much mortality, but they the associate with the reduction in cardiovascular events. They associate with reduction. Events. Yes. Okay. But here's one for you, Gary. <laughs> Hooper et al. 2015, and I went through this study some years ago, and I discussed it with Professor Hooper in an Irish Heart Foundation event in Dublin, and we had sh some interesting words. Uh, but they went through 15 RCTs replacing sat fat with polyunsaturated fat. And the conclusion was no mortality benefit for all cause, CVD, CHD, stroke, etc. No benefits for mortality for any of the diseases using polyunsaturated oil. So that was the first thing. And the second thing was there was a 15% reduction in events associated across the 15 studies. That was just barely statistically significant. I think quite a few of the RCDTs were done quite well. But that appears to be the RCT evidence for vegetable oils being better. Um, however, there are some incongruities in it. There was one trial which did have a CVD mortality benefit, the veterans, but no all-cause benefit. And the reason was a year later they published and said that the cancer rate had gone up and that had counteracted the cardiovascular benefit. So just looking at that summary all o overall of RCTs for vegetable oil, would it feel compelling to yourself, uh, Dari, or to yourself, Gary? I don't know who wants to. Uh, well, okay, so clearly not to me. But, and those studies were not done that well, with the exception of the Dayton trial that you mentioned, most of them compared a diet to a usual care or usual diet so you get a healthy user bias or a performance intervention bias when you do that. And I also talked to Professor Hooper about that. Um, the, uh, I, the issue I have is different. And I, I'm going to, it's something, uh, so Joffrey Rose, a British, famous British epidemiologist who's kind of responsible for shaping the theory of public health, preventive medicine and public health. That, we've been working with since the 80s, made this point that when you're giving public health advice, uh, especially prevention, so he also made this point that you need a higher level of evidence for prevention because you're starting with healthy people. But what you can do that seems reasonably safe is you could remove unnatural elements of the diet or the lifestyle. And you could tell people, so you, for instance, you could tell people, let's not smoke, so you don't smoke cigarettes because we think it'll cause lung cancer, but we also consider cigarettes to be something unnatural. We didn't evolve smoking cigarettes. We didn't adapt to cigarettes in our environment. And we could be reasonably confident that if we tell you to take it away, you'll be healthier. But we can't have the same confidence if we tell people to add something healthy to our diets that isn't natural. So. When we give advice, for instance, to remove refined grains and sugars, we can also be fairly certain because refined grains and sugars are relatively new additions to human diets. They're unnatural and we're suggesting they be removed. That's a different situation than when you say you will be healthier if you eat canola oil, which is a relatively new uh, addition or brand new addition to human diets. And when you're doing that, it's a situation to me that's very similar to, to, to saying we would all be healthier if we took metformin or any drug. It might be true that we would be healthier, but I need a clinical trial because we're looking at subtle health benefits and there may be subtle health risks and I want to know what the trade-off is. So if we're going to add something to the diet, whether it's to our daily routine, whether it's a new, a relatively new vegetable oil, or a relatively new sweetener, or a relatively new drug, that's where we need randomized controlled trials to tell us whether or not they'll be beneficial or not. And the fact that healthy people might do this, and if you bring up the Leon Diet Heart Study, we're going to have a long conversation afterwards. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just warning you in advance. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so that's, you need really well done. To, to, again, so in a world in which we're going to tell an entire population to add something to their diet, to add something to their life, to do something unnatural, on the assumption that it's going to make us live longer and healthier and we're never going to be able to personally measure that, we need really good clinical trials that have as the end point what we expect to happen. And the fact that healthy people might already be doing that isn't enough. Um, it's not that we can't all take the risk and decide, you know, we're just going to decide for the evidence for ourselves, whether it's we, you know, buy the Hooper study or not, and we think maybe or the, the Dayton study versus the Finnish Mental Hospital study, but ultimately we need really good clinical trials if we're going to tell people to do something that humans haven't done for the past, you know, at some level for the past two million years on a public health basis. And that, by the way, just one last thing, is very different from me saying I think you should all eat bacon because that's me. I'm a journalist. What the hell do I know? Uh, yeah, so it is, I, I haven't figured this out, and maybe this will be helpful at this conference, that I haven't quite figured out, um, first, there are no vegetable oils. I actually don't know of any vegetable oils. No, all the oils that we call vegetable oils See, are from know. nuts, seeds, or fatty fruits, like uh, olives and avocados. And so why these foods that are packed with beneficial phytochemicals um, that, you know, every analysis suggests should be healthy, nuts and seeds and, and fatty fruits. Why taking their oils and consuming them is somehow unnatural or different than taking dairy fat and turning it into butter. And the same folks that think that these oils are unhealthy think butter is okay. And the process of taking butter out of milk and turning it into butter or cheese is not that different from the process of taking oil out of avocados or olives and turning it into oil. In an ideal world, we have a clinical I, trial I, I, to test the I, butter I was, hypothesis. I, I was, buy that. I was patient to... But we're not telling. We're not, we're not giving public <laughs> advice. Wait, wait. Now, let me well, just clarify this. Point? Let me clarify. <laughs> we're not giving public health advice telling people to eat butter. Okay? No, I'm, I'm talking about so, the community. The, commu yeah. the same community of folks that think butter is fantastic somehow these oils that come from nuts and seeds and fatty fruits, um, I, I, uh, can, I, can I finish? Oh, yes. <laughs> it is, is strangely, I think these, these are harmful. So that's the first, the first point. Um, the second point is that you know, the evidence for health effects of these oils come from multiple sources. So there are randomized trials of clinical events, which have been described, and they have significant limitations. We published the very first meta-analysis of those trials, and we described all the limitations. They have significant limitations, and they suggest, as you described, a, a modest improvement in cardio overall cardiovascular disease events. The evidence also comes from randomized controlled trials of blood lipids, um, and there have been you know, at least 60 of those trials. Those are feeding trials, uh, giving, giving those oils, and those very, very clearly show multiple benefits of those oils um, compared to carbohydrate, let's say, for multiple lipid uh, biomarkers. The third line of evidence comes from randomized control trials of glucose and insulin. And we published this meta-analysis uh, a couple of years ago. Fumiaki Imamura is the first author. We looked at, um, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but I think over 100 randomized controlled feeding trials, the, the highest type of evidence to understand mechanistic effects. And we did a meta-analysis of the effects of these oils on glucose and insulin and other things, and we found very clearly that PUFA, polyunsaturated fats from these oils, uh, lowered insulin resistance, improved insulin sensitivity, um, and uh, MUFA had modest uh, effects, and saturated fat and total carbohydrate were, were relatively similar. And so you have three lines of evidence from randomized controlled trials, all concordant, improved blood lipids, improved insulin sensitivity from trials, and with very, very limited randomized controlled trials of uh, with lots of limitations, lower cardiovascular disease risk. You add to that the prospect of observational cohort studies, which have all shown you know, benefits of eating these oils. And then finally, there are biomarker studies where you look in the people's blood, and rather than asking them what they eat, which is fraught with potential limitations and biases, you measure in the blood the fatty acid levels, and observationally, you look ahead many years. And we've been publishing now in a consortium called FORCE on about 30 cohort studies around the world over 100,000 people who have objective blood biomarker measures of these fatty acids, all showing benefits, benefits for diabetes, benefits for cardiovascular disease. So, you know, and then against that, there's zero evidence for harm, zero. So, so to me, to have absolutely no evidence for harm, none, and all of this evidence is showing benefit, 
It's just a, and, and also just the, the teleologic notion that these are coming from healthy foods um, is just a very, it's very strange to me that there's a, a notion that these are unhealthy oils. The question is, if these were, so you're basically treating them like a drug. Let's just say, for instance, at the moment, you believe canola oil is something that if we were to prescribe it, you got your prescription, you went to the doctor, they said, here's your bottle of canola oil, cook with it, put it on your salad, use it daily, you will live longer. And you'll have less heart disease, and you'll even have a lower risk of diabetes and obesity and insulin resistance because of our meta-analysis. If this were a drug, statins, we're going to give it not just to adults but to kids because the adults are going to think this is how I should feed my kids. So from as soon as they're weaned onward, they're going to be getting their daily dose of canola oil. You really think that everything you said is enough to substitute. If this was a drug, could you get it approved by the FDA with a health benefit as a prescription drug based on the trials that exist now for children and adults for life? To substitute what you, you said to substitute. I never mentioned substitution. No, I didn't mean I'm saying if this oh. were dry, if canola what, oil what were it, came in, I mean, because we're all taking yeah. omega-3 yeah. capsules and all that crap, so we're going to put canola oil in a capsule, but we're yeah, gonna, yeah. the FDA's got to agree to, for the health claim. Is there, the, yeah, you, yes, you would agree you to at, give that kid If you look at life. all of the evidence, with no evidence for risk and all of the evidence for benefit, I think it's very reasonable to make public health recommendations to increase the intakes of those oils. And you think the just FDA like, would approve like that if it were a from, drug? Sorry? Do you think the FDA would approve that if it were a drug for children for life based on the evidence that exists today? Um, I think the FDA's procedures for approving drugs um, is, are quite different and should be different um, because those are for-profit, um, you know, well, very, very bioactive things. Oil, uh, well, I mean, every food is sold for profit, but drugs are... Quite, quite different, I think, than, than food. Um, I, I think with that argument, Gary, that the, the, you know, sort of the, you know, you, you can look at the extreme, right? So if you take that approach that the level of evidence you're expecting to make a public health, you know, discussion, we couldn't argue that smoking cessation is valid because there's been no randomized trials showing that smoking cessation reduces risk. We couldn't say physical activity is beneficial because there's been no randomized control trials showing that physical activity lowers clinical risk. Well, we don't know and we couldn't say that wearing seatbelts is beneficial because there's been no randomized yeah, control are... trials showing wearing seatbelts is beneficial. So I think that, that, yes, I think that if you take, again, all of the randomized control trial evidence, but all the of the observational evidence. If you have evidence, a car accident and you're wearing seatbelts yeah. or not, you'll know whether the seatbelt saved your life. You will never know if the canola oil saved your life. Uh, you, you won't know if the seatbelt saved your life or not because you're likely to know. You either died or didn't die, and you won't know if the seatbelt made a difference, right? No, so you're true if you I, didn't have it. I, I your think next I, of kin will know. Can we say that? <laughs> I think if you're going to make, if you're going to, if we're going to have any level of evidence to make general public health recommendations, you know, we have to have reasonable evidence, no evidence for harm, reasonable evidence for benefit, and I think that certainly. Healthy plant oils, I call them plant oils or nut and seed and fruit oils, meet that level of evidence. Uh, I think in fairness, uh, Dari, just to clarify earlier, no one would be concerned about crushed avocado or crushed olives or fruits or any of those essentially real food oils or coconut. Uh, the whole discussion is around the industrial high temperature pressure solvent yeah. extract tortured molecules yeah. scenario of these oils. <laughs> That's great. No, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I, I also, wait, so let me, let me say something else. I also, wait, I, I also what I, but, what, but the, I think that's a great point, and I fully agree, and I've written about this, that maybe these oils would be even healthier if we actually made them virgin and natural. They very likely would be, but all of the evidence I described is using those oils. And so, and using the industrialized, you know, hyper, hyper modified, you know, crushed, et cetera, you know, oils. The evidence I described is with those oils. So I fully agree with you. It's like mercury and fish. Fish is good for you. If you, if you have it without mercury, it's even better for you. You know, but, 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 but you, know, uh, uh, you know, all the evidence I described is, again is with those oils. So I, but I fully agree with you. We should hold industry responsible to test virgin, more natural virgin, uh, versions of those oils. I, I fully recommend extra virgin olive oil over refined non-virgin olive oil. There are starting to be virgin soybean oils. I, I cer certainly recommend those. Avocado oil is, is a great choice, I think. It tends to be you know, uh, less processed. So, so they, they may be better if we don't do those things, but there's no evidence they're harmful. I'll, I'll have to ask the question. I'm sorry. Um, the contrary trials using these oils replacing saturated fats, so the Sydney 
heart trial, which was the data was revealed. It was gotten two years ago in the BMJ, and there was higher all cause mortality, higher cardiovascular with the polyunsaturated intervention. The Helsinki Businessman's trial, same thing. I think Minnesota was the other one, and the Coronary Club a long time back. So there's multiple RCT trials that backfired, if you will. You know, what do you think of those? They're just just marks on history. So no, they're all in the meta-analysis, and so they, they are, are in the meta-analysis of, 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 the, of, the, of the oils. The, the Sydney Diet Heart Study, um, uh, which the, the new publication didn't reveal anything new, all the data had been published other than the observational component of that, which is biased, potentially. The, the, the Sydney Diet Heart trial was a trial of uh, uh, what they thought were healthy plant oils in a trans fat margarine. So, so that trial used a 30 to 40 percent trans fat margarine against thinking this was a healthy choice back in the day, and it raised mortality. And we know trans fat is, is harmful for mortality. So I think that that's a uh, you know we don't want to use trans fat uh, as as a replacement for for butter. I think that's a really bad idea. And that's what the Sydney Diet Heart Study showed. I think we're being asked to cut. Oh yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah.